you're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick. I have Matt Reynolds with me. Howdy. And we're going to talk about sports specific training in a moment. But before we do that, I want to let you know that you should go to YouTube and subscribe to our YouTube channel because there are all kinds of goodies there. You've probably heard me talk about it. Instructional videos, these long form podcasts are there. You can go to barbellogic.com and subscribe to the Friday Fives newsletter. But Matt wanted to talk about sports specific training today. So I'm going to listen. We get this question a lot, and so it's time that we addressed it. We have lots of people that ask us about training for sports and what that looks like. And so give you just a super quick background on me. I was the head strength coach of a 5A high school in Missouri, which that's as big as it gets in Missouri. It wasn't the biggest school in Missouri. It was pretty good size. I think it was about 1,600 kids in the high school and did that for nearly 10 years and had a really good strength program there. It wasn't because of me. We developed some really good coaches over the years, including a guy, Johnny Gold, used to be a coach as well. A buddy of mine was uh, one of the football coaches, got a 765 deadlift, pretty strong. And at one point, I think we had eight coaches at the school that I taught at that could bench press over 400 pounds raw. That's a bunch of coaches. We just sort of had a culture of strength there, and we did it right for quite a while. The football coach... There was a good buddy of mine. The guy was like a 45-year-old jacked-looking bodybuilder dude. Really super kind guy. He turned over the strength program to Jonathan Golden and myself. And we did that really with complete freedom for about six years. And then that football coach left because his son went to another school. And his son was going to be a senior. And he had never seen his son play football. How weird would that think about that? So he'd never seen his son play football because he was a he was the football coach of a rival school. That's what would happen if I had a son who played football. <laughs> and so he left and took an assistant coaching position at the school that his son was at. So he could watch his kid play. And we got a new football coach. And that new football coach thought that he knew really about everything because that's what football coaches do. Can't stand him. Okay. I mean, like if I walk through like the top 10 people that I can't stand, he's one of them. He's in the top 10. There you go. He sat us down, Jonathan Gold and I, at the time I was a professional strongman. Again, Johnny Gold had a nearly 800 pound deadlift. And he said, you guys don't know what strong is. He said, I know what strong is. What strong is, is we're going to go to the football team that won the state championship. And we're going to ask them what they do in the weight room. And we're going to do that. That's ludicrous. Why do teams win state championships? Because they got the best kids. Because they got the best athletes. There is an old saying in football that says, it's not the X's and the O's, it's the Jimmy's and the Joe's. You think your strategizing wins these games. It doesn't. It's the boys, right. right? It's the athletes. And so, you know, quickly my time was short as the strength coach there and leaving the strength coaching position after a couple of years. I worked with them for a few years, but it was just to, you know, force us to do bigger, faster, stronger, the Nebraska program or the Oklahoma program. And, you know, because 14-year-old uh, boys in Southwest Missouri – um, are essentially the same athlete that Division I Oklahoma football players are, except they're not right at all. And what we know about football players at Oklahoma, of course, this is back in Oklahoma. I don't know. Is Oklahoma any good? Don't know. Don't watch sports anymore. I have no idea. Assume, let's say they're still good. Uh, Nebraska back then was still really good, and I know they'd kind of taken a dip the last decade or so. Any program works for those guys because they're freaks. That's what works. And so we have to think about how to approach sports-specific training, not specifically for football, but really for any sport. The thing that is in fashion in strength training now is to do strength conditioning so that it looks like the sport, right? I'm going to squat in my lineman stance because I'm a lineman, and I just want to get as strong as I could possibly be in that lineman stance. Or I'm going to do exercises that look like throwing a shot put or look like throwing a baseball, or do rotational drills for a swing in a baseball bat. And that's strength and conditioning. And the problem with that, and by the way, that's every level. So it really comes from the top down. That started at sort of the NFL or like Major League Baseball or like the professional level. And because those guys are the guys that do it, and they're the role models for the younger athletes, it just gets passed down. Division one follows suit. Seems right. 
and high school follows what Division One does, right? And so it's often getting those jobs at the Division One and professional level are less about what you know and more about who you know. And, you know, every or the vast majority of strength coaches at the high school level, and there aren't a lot of strength coaches at the high school level, most of the time it's the football coach. Most of those guys know a handful of friends at the collegiate level, and they ask them what they do. And so this is what we do. You know, we do all these rotational drills, and one of my closest friends, who is a good strength coach, doesn't totally get it and has just been in that culture for so long. At one point was the head football strength coach at a major Division One university in Texas. I'll just say that. So I don't actually throw the actual one under the bus. And he invited me out to watch them do their strength and conditioning stuff. And what I experienced was we had to be there at 4.30 in the morning. Now, I get up early, but I don't have to be somewhere at 4.30 in the right. morning. That ain't fun. And when we got there, you know, he's the head, or at the time at this place, was the head strength coach at this Division One head football strength coach, like a top 10 football school at the time. They were top 10. And walked in the weight room, which was beautiful, you know, multi-million dollar facility, incredible equipment and things like that. There were already like 18 people running around in there. I got there at 4.30. We didn't turn the lights on, Scott. We walked in at 4.30 and there were 18, 20 other people running around like chickens with their heads cut off. Other coaches, grad assistants, college kids, making copies, writing on the whiteboard. It was actually, you know, there was a part of it that was like, it wasn't chaos. It was like everybody had a job to do and they were doing the job. I just like, damn, this is so early to be doing this stuff. And at five till six, at 5.55 a.m., I started to hear commotion and I looked out of the weight room doors and the football players were lining up outside the doors, but they're not allowed to come in. As a matter of fact, I believe the strength coaches lock them out of the weight room. And so they're all lined up there. It's not even 6 a.m., right? And I would find out later that these guys that were there at 6 a.m., most of them were freshmen or redshirt freshmen or maybe sophomores. They were guys that had to take 8 a.m. classes, so they had to get their stuff done before 8 a.m. And so it's 5.55, and now and it's the tension and the intensity in the room is building up in the weight room, even though there's no athletes in there yet. And the coaches start talking to each other more like W Dead wrestlers the last couple minutes, and they're yelling at each other and firing each other up. And, yeah, yeah, bro. Yeah, here we go, here we go, here we go, right? And then they turn on the Metallica, and they turn it way up and blast it up, and the clock is, says 5.59, and they're counting down, and all of a sudden, all 18 of these strength coaches make two lines, you know, nine people on each side of the doorway, and that clock hits six, and boom, we kick that door open, and yeah, mother here we go, here we go, here we go. <laughs> Charity and I are going to start doing that. No shit. That's literally what I saw. Listen, I'm watching this shit, Scott, and I'm like... <laughs> I can't believe this is real life. And those guys bust in and they don't squat and they don't deadlift and they don't bench press and they don't press. They came in and did a bunch of bullshit stuff. I think they did some power cleans. They did a circuit is what they did. They actually did a circuit. Like they would do a power clean station and then they do some barbell rows and then they do some stuff there. They gave them their choice of whatever arm work they wanted to do. So they would do like some dumbbell curls or some tricep push downs. And they just did this like, bullshit circuit for like 40 minutes and at 6 40 they started yelling at all the guys you know clean up clean up clean up clean up here we go here we go here we go right and at 6 45 exactly everybody took off in a dead sprint to the practice field and i'm running i'm like oh my god and i'm i'm sprinting here's you know i'm sprinting i'm sprinting i'm sprinting i'm sprinting i don't know what the hell's going on <laughs> i'm just trying to stay caught up with my buddy who's the strength coach and we get to the practice field, and when we get to the practice field, the strength coaches, they all start running around. The practice field is a little ways away, and they've got maybe 10 minutes to set up before 7 a.m., so they get all these drills set up. And, you know, it's a practice field. It's an indoor facility. It's a full-blown 100-yard indoor giant practice field. Again, because that's what you need. Big-time school, turf, you know, all turf. And the rest of the football team comes in, and they're ready, same sort of deal, and they line them all up, and they do 47 dynamic warm-up movements. No sh**. I wrote them down, marked them. 47, you know, high knees, high knees, high knees, you know, tail kickers, karaoke, whatever. I was like, what am I watching? <laughs> right? Now, 
there was a piece about it that was very sort of military, you know, boot campy like, and I actually liked the discipline of it all. It wasn't all bad, but I still, I remember watching it and thinking like, I cannot believe what I'm watching. And there was no coaching. The guys would fire off and they'd do it wrong. And I remember one of the coaches, not my buddy, but one of the other coaches, you know, he'd blow his whistle, tweet. And he's like, hey, motherfucker, do it fucking right next time. Do it right. You do it wrong. Right. And they line him back up and make him do it again. Now, wait a minute. There was no coaching. They just said they did it wrong. You don't deserve to wear that fucking logo on your shirt that says the school's name. Take your shirt off and turn it inside out. I watched that. Made the kid take his shirt off, turn it inside out, put it back on. This is a top 10 football school. My thought is, like, what's wrong with the kids? Well, they're inner city, broke. They get to go play football for a top 10 school, possibly go to the NFL, make millions of dollars, get a college education, you know, in PE or communication. Sociology. Shit. Yeah, whatever. I can't blame the kids, you know? I blame the coaches and I blame the culture. And, like, at what point do you go, holy shit? Now, the vast majority of people that are listening to this podcast don't have kids who are going to Division One universities. They have kids that are going to high school who are playing on you know, their high school softball team. An important thing to note is that the thing that works, rather than coming from the top down, it should actually come from the bottom up. The thing that works for high school kids, because high school kids are the most normal, the most average, they are average by their very demographic, right? What works for the most average people will actually work for the most genetically gifted athletes on the planet. The reality is that anything works for genetically gifted athletes. It doesn't really matter what they do, right? I remember hearing somebody say, talking about the USC football team back in the early 2000s and they were winning national championships over and over again, that their strength and conditioning program could be that they walked into the weight room and the strength coaches kicked them in the balls 10 times and they'd go out and still win 10 games a year because they're the best players on the planet. That's what right. they are. Like, it really doesn't matter what they do. And this shows because I was at a top 10 football school in the world and these guys were amazing football players and the shit they did was dumb. Yeah, that kind of stuff happens a lot, actually. Like, you know, Harvard's like, oh, we're a great school. Wait a minute. Do you know that you're a really good school or do you just have the best screening process and you just pick the best people sure. and then you get in front of the parade and act like you're leading it? That's right. That's right. Of course, that's what happens. And so and the two factors that we look at are training and practice and how those interplay. And this works at any level. And so ultimately, what are we trying to do as an athlete? Well, we're trying to get better for the performance. Regardless of what that is, that's the game, the game, the run, the, match, the meet, the run, the meet. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so by the very nature of what we're doing, it's very easy to understand the concept of training here because the way we define training, we've talked about in the fitness world, training versus exercise. People exercise just it's about today. People that train are working towards a common goal. Well, in sports, we all have this goal, which is the performance. If I'm actually competing in the sport, which if you're not competing in the sport, you're not actually an athlete. You're not actually playing the sport, right? If you're just shooting hoops with your kid. You're a hobbyist. You're just having fun. There's nothing wrong with that, but you're not an athlete. It's not sports performance. So I'm preparing for the basketball game, the football game, the powerlifting meet, the marathon, the 5K, or whatever. And so that's the performance, right? It's a specific point in time where there's an athletic event where I have to prepare and demonstrate effort under the scrutiny of judges or against competition. That's it, right? Now, here's the thing. Here's where coaches screw this up. What is training? This is where coaches must screw it up? Yeah, like what's training in, in the grand scheme of everything, right? Like not just weightlifting, but what? Training is a logical stepwise process that brings us closer and closer to a goal. But specifically requires a physiological adaptation. Right, yes. Training brings about a specific physiological adaptation and the adaptation should be specific to the performance. Yep. Right? Now, let's be clear. What I mean by specific, I mean the performance is going to require some physiological adaptations. Very easy. Let's talk about powerlifting. What sort of physiological adaptations are required? Force production. That's it, man. That's the one, right? What sort of physiological adaptations are required for a marathon? Cardiovascular. Cardiorespiratory, right? Endurance. Aerobic endurance. That's, That's it. it. That's really the thing. There's not much form. Matter of fact, there's far less form to run in marathons than there are powerlifting, right? They don't have to practice a lot. Yeah, and I would argue that there's far less form work in powerlifting than there is something like football, right, or wrestling. 
where there's a lot of form stuff, right? But there's certainly form work. Obviously, there's form work. And so what training is, is you look at the specific physiological adaptations necessary for improved performance in the athletic event, and that's how we train. So these things may be metabolic in nature or they may be structural, but training is the thing that works that. And that doesn't need to look like the sport. If force production is needed in football. Clearly it is. Clearly it is. Then I don't practice or I don't train force production in my football stance. I train force production with the movements that increase force production in the most efficient and effective way possible. That's it. That's it. Clearly. I don't squat in the lineman stance. I don't have to do that jammer thing. You're saying jammer. Yep. It's the idea of like a lineman punching. Like I could actually just squat and deadlift and power clean and press and bench press. Can't tell you how many times as a football coach I heard other football coaches say, I would never have my guys bench press. Why? Because you're not laying on your back, pushing guys off of you. I actually heard this. Like, this is actually the rationale. Now, listen, the average IQ of an American high school, you know, a football coach in America is probably 88. Hmm. It ain't 100. These are not smart guys. There's outliers. You know who you are. Is there a Reynolds exaggeration in that? I don't know, man. I can't stand high school football coaches. Now, listen, I had a guy that was a football coach that was great. He was great, a great individual. If I saw him today in town, I'd give him a huge hug. I'd tell him what it means to me. He was a wonderful man. Not only was he a football coach, he was a mentor to these guys. Like, he taught them how to be men. That's what it would be at its best, Taught of them how to be men, right? He talked to them about how to treat women. He talked to them about how to study for their schoolwork. He talked to him about taking pride in what you do and what your locker should look like and why that matters and things like that. Like that stuff. So of course, there's some great ones out there, but most of them are pieces of shit. And they don't understand. And so they think that what we do is we try to make the training look like the sport. And so we do shit like stand their balance on BOSU balls. Because that looks like the sport. Because <laughs> it, Yeah, because there's balance involved and, you know, all sorts of just ridiculousness, right? And the reality is that every single sport has some sort of physiological adaptations that must occur. And those are either going to be metabolic or structural. That's it. Those are the two. It's metabolic or or both, right? Like sport like football has both, right? Powerlifting, really just one. (laughs) Right. Because, you know, those guys are ready to die from a cardiovascular event. So running a marathon, certainly there is some strength component, but it's very, very low compared to the metabolic adaptations that must occur. All you have to do is just look at a competitive marathoner. That's right. There's not a lot of force production coming out of those bodies. Like a real competitive one. Yeah, right. Like in the Olympics. Yes. Right. And you're like, oh, is that person recovering from cancer or AIDS? Right. No, it's a marathon runner. Actually, that's a world-class athlete. Right. And you're like, oh, okay. I would rather look like the 100 meter sprinter. <laughs> you Have know? you seen these like human powered aircraft? Like there was one, I think it was a called human like human powered aircraft. Yeah, there was one called like Gossamer Albatross, I think. It was like Burt Rutan, I think. They like rode a bicycle thing. Yeah, you just like pedal this damn thing, you know, and it's got a huge wingspan, but it's like super lightweight. Right. It's like an ultralight, but you pedal the. Yeah. And it goes like 1.3 miles an hour. (laughs) Yeah. Real slow. The whole time you're like, don't stop pedaling. Don't stop. We'll nosedive. Yeah. It's so specialized that it's just useless for anything. Yeah. When I look at marathoners, I I see the exact (laughs) same thing. That's what you think. Yeah, I mean, the physiological adaptations that still have to occur, though, I mean, there's certainly ways to train the metabolic energy pathway systems that a marathon requires without having to go out and run a marathon. You can't run a marathon every day. Nope. You don't go out and run 26.2 miles every day. They have to day. peak, too. They have to peak, too, right? Now, certainly there are probably the greater structural pieces that occur in a marathon. It's just getting things like your feet and your ankles and your joints ready to handle the beating because it's a beating, right? Yeah. Marathon runners don't need to squat 400 pounds, but their lower bodies better be able to take the beating and run in 26.2 miles. So there are structural adaptations that occur there. The the point is that the physiological adaptations are not dependent on any specific movement pattern. They're not dependent on movement pattern by their very nature. They're physiological adaptations that are structural or metabolic. And so what we do as athletes is we go, what are the requirements for the sport from a physiological standpoint? And we train that in the way that it can be trained most efficiently, which again, for strength, are squats and deadlifts. That's what we do, right? And maybe for the metabolic pathway, you find the thing that requires the least amount of impact on your body when needed, right? And you train that, right? So I don't need to throw a heavy baseball 
to be better at throwing a baseball faster. That's not how I throw a baseball faster. So let's talk about the other factors. We have training, which is the physiological adaptation, and then we have practice, right? And practice is that repetitive execution of the specific movements and skills needed to perform the sport, right? Honing the skill. That's right. And it's completely dependent on both accuracy and precision. Remember how we define those different, putting you on the spot? Well, accuracy is the ability to do the same thing over and over and over again, but the precision... Nope, you fl flipped them. Is that right? Accuracy is how close you are to hitting the bullseye. That's right. And then precision is I can stack them all up right on, on top the of each other. That's exactly right. Can you repeat it? Yeah. Subsequent. Or as I often say, subsequent. Subsequent, right? I like that way better. Okay. So what does practice look like for football? For, let's say, a lineman. Yeah, they're just going to be blocking and practicing That's all exactly stuff. right. They're practicing their footwork. They're actually against other people most often. They're trying to work motor patterns. So that in the heat of the game, of the competition, in the same way that I want a power lifter to be able to squat at a powerlifting meet and not have to think about the form, because the form is so deeply ingrained in their motor patterns, football is the same way, right? My kids do gymnastics. What my kids do for gymnastics is they work on their strength. They come in the weight room and they do strength training and they do things like dips, lots of body weight calisthenics. I have young kids, little girls, right? They do tons of chin-ups and pull-ups, and they just try to get their body as strong as they can. They still squat and deadlift, but they can't really train squat and deadlift because they're like they're still prepubescent. Yep. Then they go out and practice gymnastics. That's what they do. They practice the thing, right? And sometimes they take those big movements, and they chop them up into little pieces of that movement, and they develop the motor pattern so they don't have to think about it when it comes time to actually compete at gymnastics. So my girls compete a little bit at gymnastics. They're not real serious about it, but they do that. And so that's what we do. So we have practice which is the practicing the actual motor patterns involved in the sport and we have training which is the physiological adaptations that occur and when we do both of those things that leads to an improvement in performance so let's take the baseball pitcher a baseball pitcher needs to be able to throw a baseball really really fast really really hard but he also needs to be very very accurate and precise be able to do it over and over again and so what that guy should do first off what sort of metabolic adaptations are required to be a pitcher in baseball not very zero i know because there's some pitchers in baseball that weigh 330 pounds and like you know are alcoholics right. every night they're not they're, they're not <laughs> john pitching. daly so yeah john daly like what kind of yeah for golf what kind of metabolic sort of adapt very little very little but a baseball pitcher clearly needs to be strong right like the stronger you are the better you are so i could either throw a heavy baseball or which is going to actually f the motor pattern for throwing a normal baseball or I could just go in the weight room and just get the guy strong. And then also let him practice throwing a baseball. Right. The whole time he's getting strong. So while the structural adaptations are occurring and the guy's actually getting stronger and his body's changing, he's building some muscle and maybe certain ligaments could be tightening up if I weren't continuing to throw the baseball, I just let him keep throwing the baseball. So he goes in the weight room and he trains three or four days a week. And then he throws the baseball every day or every other day and practices the thing. So that he's honing both the skills and the motor pattern for the pitching and the structural adaptations that occur. And it's literally that simple. Yep. That's it. You actually don't need 47 dynamic warm-up movements. Yeah, I don't know a lot about any of these sports that you speak of, but it's my understanding that this is one of the reasons Tiger Woods is Tiger Woods. Yep. It's not a baseball pitcher, but it's very similar, right? Yep. The ability to reproduce a swing over and over and over and over again, the exact same swing. Yeah, he's going to swing the club really 70 important. times. Probably more, but yeah. In a meet. Sure. In a performance. So, right. How much of a metabolic thing? Nah, I don't know. But he's one of the first golfers that consistently barbell trained. Yeah, he got real strong. He got his bench press over 400 pounds. Yep. And of course, the commentators on CBS said, boy, I think that bench press tightened up Tiger's swing. <laughs> You're like, what are you talking about? Except that Tiger continued to swing every single day while he trained. Yep. And he's the best golfer of all time, right? Now. And he's winning again. And he's starting to win again. And he's an older guy. And he's old, right? And he's a master's athlete. And he's starting to win again. <laughs> it's, it's one of those deals. Like, obviously, there's other things involved. Like, there's lots of mental, psychological pieces of this. Especially sure. things like golf and baseball and really any sport. There's psychological. Somebody like Arnold Palmer would have had those already. Correct. That's exactly right. Arnold Palmer had the motor patterns of a golf swing figured out. Yep. And he had the mental and psychological pieces of the game obviously figured out. That guy could handle high-pressure situations. Arnold Palmer could do that. And 
he made a delicious drink. <laughs> you know, tea and lemonade, pretty damn good when it's hot outside. Yeah. It's fine. But it wasn't very strong. He was never going to drive the ball 330 yards. He just wasn't. And so now the new crop of golfers you're seeing, they crush the ball. And they all look like that. Yeah. All these young guys from 30, 31, 32 and younger are pretty damn jacked for a golfer. Right. Yeah, they're not two forty five and six no, feet tall. No. They're one eighty seven, they're one ninety five sometimes. And they knock the shit out of the ball. Right. And because they continue to practice the skill, the motor pattern of a consistent, repeatable golf swing, then they continue to hone their skills and their motor patterns while getting stronger and having those structural adaptations. Listen, Barry Bonds got to be a he was already really good at putting the bat on the ball. <laughs> Real good. Yeah. The guy was already a Hall of Fame caliber player, and then he took steroids. Now, did he take steroids so he could hit improve the Improve his form? So he could improve putting the bat on the ball? No, he still hit the ball in the exact same spot that he did before the steroids. Only now, the force production increased, which means the ball goes further. Yep. Like, over the fence further, right? And so the guy hits lots of home runs. That's so interesting that there is even an out-of-bounds in the game of baseball at this point. Like, so if you can hit the ball X far. It should be good. You win. No, I mean, like, period, you win. Right. So there's a threshold where you win. Like, if you can hit it X far. Right. You get to go all the way around the thing. and you get to Oh, score. yeah, I see what you're saying. Like, yeah, like, different parks have different, right? So, like, there are times where you can hit a ball 405 feet, and it doesn't leave the park. Right. It ought to be, like, the fence ought to be, like, 800 feet out. And if you can hit it far enough that that center fielder has to, like, <laughs> run another 100 yards, you know, then you get to go all the way yeah, on the yeah. bases. Such yeah. a weird game anyway. I actually use one of the games that I miss watching. I miss the calm games. Like, yeah, I used to be a huge sports fan. Growing up as a kid, I was joking with some of our guests this week that when I was never really a kid, I never liked cartoons. I never played with G.I. Joes. I just wasn't my thing. I just, you know, watched the nightly news. And, <laughs> Walter and I played sports. That's what I did. And so with that, like I'd read the sports almanac and I would memorize the stats and the sports almanac. I love that sort of stuff. I don't miss, I have too much anxiety and too much stress in my life anyway now. I really don't miss NFL football, even though NFL football was my favorite. I kind of mm -hmm. miss watching golf. And I kind of miss watching like a no shit baseball game, especially like a pitcher's duel that ends up one to nothing. You know, where somebody like sacrifice bunts somebody home. That sounds like hell to me. Oh, I just love it. I just miss it. But I haven't watched anything in five years. I haven't watched these sports. They're like, Scott, we're very disappointed with how you've lived your life. You're going to have to watch <laughs> one to zero baseball games <laughs> for eternity. And you're like, no. No. I always thought if I died and went to hell, it would be like a club, you know, with like loud, like techno music and like neon lights. And it's <laughs> real hot. Yeah. And all the drinks are $22. <laughs> That's hell. <laughs> That's hell. And none of them have any alcohol in them anyway, right? They just have a tiny little bit of alcohol and mostly fruit juice. Yeah. So this is sports. So sports-specific training looks like this. Training is not specific to the sport. The training is specific to the physiological adaptation. And the practice is specific to the sport. Yep. And that's the motor pattern. And when you both train and practice, performance increases. That's how it works. That's it. The only other piece to it is the psychological part. And that's an important part. And we haven't been able to define exactly how that works. There are people out there that specialize in those sorts of things. I do know this. My experience has been that when people make structural changes to their bodies, specifically via strength training, they see improvement in the psychological aspect of the sport as well. Good structural changes. Not that they become cutters. No, <laughs> right. Yeah, we had a kid that won. He was a heavyweight state champion wrestler, heavyweight state champion wrestler. Again, big school, sophomore, junior, senior year, right? That's big time. Three years. Yeah. Three years in a row. Kid was just stronger than everybody else. Yeah. Didn't have the best form. Had pretty good form. Wasn't the hardest worker. Had a great wrestling coach. Man, this guy was just a badass. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell a story. It's been long enough now. I'm going to tell. I think the statute of limitations has gone. Then I can kind of end with this story. <laughs> So you remember we ate breakfast yesterday at a place and a guy said, hey, are you coach so-and-so? Yeah. And I wasn't, but this guy thought that I was the guy I'm going to tell a story about. I won't call him my name. So there was a coach. There once was a coach. Yeah, he's still a coach, just not in the public sector. <laughs> you understand why after the story. And so this guy was awesome. He's probably 10 years older than me, maybe 12 years older than me. So the guy's pushing 50s, 50 now. 
God, I almost need a name for this guy. That's not, give me a name. Hank. Hank. Good coach. Hank. Coach Hank. All right. I walk up to him in the weight room. So he was the wrestling coach and he was jacked and he was bald. I mean, the guy was jacked, right? So 45 and he was just, and he talked like Macho Man Randy Savage. <laughs> yeah. Not as excited, <laughs> but I would say, hey, Coach Hank, how are things going? And he'd walk up to me, he'd go. Put his hands on his hips. Put his hands like <laughs> up by his like obliques almost. Right. And he would say, our community is broken. <laughs> <laughs> we need to have this guy on the show. Oh my God, this guy would be the best. This guy would be the best telling stories. We'd have to, we couldn't let him say his name. <laughs> this was a guy who I'm like, listen, this guy's got a couple dudes in his freezer at home. Right. Don't know it for sure. Not only would I not put it past him, I would say it's a high probability. Right. He won like the national wrestling championship for the Masters. For 40 and over, I might have been 35 and over, and he was like 46. <laughs> right. This guy wrestled with his kids every day. The kid that won the state championship, who's a heavyweight, and this coach maybe weighed, he was probably 5'9, not real tall, and probably 245. And I'm talking about jacked and lean, right? And he would wrestle with the heavyweight because he didn't have anybody else. Like, how are you going to get the kid better? Right. How are you going to practice the thing? This guy very much bought into. He was running a dojo. Oh my God. Dude, this guy was insane. And, of course, wrestling is one of those sports where, like, tremendous structural changes need to occur and metabolic changes need to occur, right? You think about, like, you're going three, four minutes straight, no rest. You're talking about super death struggle, lactic, right. glycolytic, like, lots of waste product, not lactic acid, but lots lactate. of lactate buildup sort of things that are going on, right? Okay, so this guy, as a teacher, one of the things that you hated the most was the week you had lunch duty. So, like, two weeks out of the year, you had lunch duty, you had to be in the cafeteria, yeah, that one's D. Our community's broken. <laughs> <laughs> Our community is broken. That's what he would say. And then he would go on a diatribe about how broken our community. And he was right. That community was broken. And so one day this guy's in the <laughs> I can't believe I tell this story. It's been long enough. It's been great. So this guy's in the lunchroom and you know he's just eating his lunch, eating his tray lunch. Just man, just big jack, wide back, you know, huge shoulders. And he's telling me the story after lunch. Say, how was the day? you're not going to believe what happened at lunchtime today. So he's telling me the story first person. <laughs> and so, so this kid, he goes, would you believe that this kid ate his lunch and got up and didn't throw his tray away? He's pissed. I'm like, yeah, I can believe that. Right. High school kid, do dumb. Shit. He said, well, I'm trying to imagine Macho man. Randy. Yeah, that's shit. exactly that. You know, he said, and I said, Hey, you, throw your damn tray away because <laughs> he'd say whatever he wanted. And that kid turned to me and he told me to go f myself. And as soon as he told me the story, I was like, oh my oh God, no. <laughs> I have to bury a body. <laughs> this guy killed somebody, right? And he said, Reynolds, I did the right thing. <laughs> said, I walked over to the principal. Now our principal at the time, that guy was like a division one athlete for a long time. He was in the same thing. He was, seven, eight years older than me, but he was about 6'3", 265. Mm. Not fat, just a big, thick dude. And the school resource officer, who was an actual cop, who fought Hoist Gracie three times in the UFC and lost all three times, but was like one of the top Brazilian jiu-jitsu guys and one of the best Brazilian jiu-jitsu instructors I've ever seen. He walks over and gets those two guys and says, you see that guy over there? He goes, he just told me to go fuck myself because he wouldn't throw his tray away. Hold my gun. <laughs> he goes, you guys need to take care of this or I will. That's what he said. He said, I just sat back down and ate my lunch. I said, okay. He said, a few minutes later, the principal and the resource officer come walking up with this kid. He doesn't even notice. He's eating at his tray. They tap him on the shoulder and he turns around, you know, looks in his non-mobile way, right? You turn the whole body because he's so muscle bound. And the kid says, uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Uh, Hank, Mr. Coach Hank, sir. Uh, I I just wanted to um, I just wanted to apologize for what I said back there. And Coach Hank says, "How old are you?" Not appreciate that, sir. Uh -uh. And the kid says, uh, uh, "17, sir." So when you turn eighteen, he says, <laughs> "March first. Because I tell you what. You can take that apology and shove it up your ass. <laughs> it's March 2nd. And on March 1st, 
here's the address to my house. You knock on my door, and when I open it, you hit me as hard as you can right between the eyes, and we'll see how this fucking ends. That's what he says to the kid. <laughs> <laughs> I did the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And the principal's standing there. <sighs> and that was this guy. <laughs> I mean, there's lots of stories like that. That's who he was. So, yeah, this guy was nuts. Eventually, that caught up to him. Yeah. And uh, you can't teach him public schools when you say stuff like that all the time. So, eventually, it got him. But, uh, great dude. Understood this. Actually, completely turned around the wrestling program at the school I taught. You know, we went from being a horrible wrestling school. Nobody ever even went to state, having multiple state champions across multiple weight classes. Because the guy knew what he was doing. Because he came in and he beat their ass in the weight room and made him get strong. And then he would go up after they were done getting strong, not before, but after they were done getting strong, he'd go up and he'd condition them to death, right? And then they would, <laughs> they would go in the wrestling room after they were exhausted and they'd wrestle each other for two hours and work yep. on moves. That's what he did. And that's how you make people perform, right? Structural adaptations, metabolic adaptations, these physiological things that have to occur, and then practice the sport and get out there and kick ass and crush it. We recorded an episode not too long ago. I don't know what order these are going to come out in. As we're recording this, we haven't released the show that we did about programming for older folks. I have people that are over 40 wanting me to help them perform for a sport. Yep. I'm looking at you, Mel. Yep. And, you know, we talk in that episode about how sort of precarious their training is and, you know, how precarious it is to manage their fatigue and all that stuff. And, man... You know, if you're actually practicing a sport, and particularly if that sport has some sort of impact involved in it, like like jujitsu or something like that, it is really, really hard for these older folks to train for strength and for performance in some sort of sport. I mean, it's just too much. At some yeah, point, you sure. know, you can imagine if you're 73, you, you can't be training for, you know, a 10K nope. and barbell training. Like, it's just too much. And, you have to learn how to manage the stress and managing the stress. That's the, is this an additional yeah, stress? Yeah, the 16-year-old kids that were on the wrestling team. Just add food. You can do anything to them. Even when they won't eat food, they're, you know, they recover. It's bizarre, right? Certainly food helps, You right? cut them and they heal like the Terminator. Yeah, right. It's insane. And as you get older, like, obviously, you can handle so much less stress. It's like when you're 16, you've got a daily budget of, like, $10,000, a physiological $10,000 budget. Right. And when you're 60, it's $100. Or whatever, yeah, yeah. right? And so you're like, where am I going to spend this money? Well, if squats are $70, now you don't have much money left over to divvy out across the board to other things, right? Like, okay, well, I still got a deadlift, I got a press, I got a bench, and oh, by the way, I want to go to Brazilian jiu-jitsu class. Mm -hmm. uh, to Mel's credit, he just entered his first jiu-jitsu meet, I don't know, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, or something like that, and did very well. And by his own admission, he's like, you know, my technique's not the greatest, you know, but he's like, I'm double overhanding these deadlifts and they're heavy. I get hold of those guys. They cannot get rid of me. Yeah. And, you know, he's like, it requires all of their strength in perfect form for them to handle him. Yeah. And then he did very well. And it's because he's gotten strong. Yeah. It's one of the arguments, not to make it a USAW talk because nobody really gives a shit, I know, but it's really what this originally came from was the strongest guys who ever lived in Olympic weightlifting, which was really the guys from like 68 to 72, right? Yeah. You're looking at Alexiev and Redding and Patera and those guys, right? And Bednarski and those guys didn't have the best form. They were so strong. Those guys are pressing 500 pounds. You know, we talk about those three guys press 500 pounds, Alexiev and Redding and Patera. I believe Bednarski is the only guy who had a double body weight press, right? It was like 484 at 242, mm. 45 at 240. Think about that. I'm talking about a strict press, a, a non-push press, right? So no knee. There were hips and layback, but no knee. So strong. I said, man, American weightlifters have really beautiful, pretty, perfect form, and we're just not very strong. We need to get stronger. You know, they may disagree with that. Some of those guys in USAW, it's fine. But look, remember, we just got to train the physiological adaptations, and then we train the motor patterns. And when we do those two things, we get better. And that's true. There's a guy in my hometown who I won't name who is into Olympic weightlifting. And he's not big, not even big for his height. His form seems to be very, very good. Everything I can tell about it is. And he doesn't move any weight because he won't do the strength component. He just won't do it. Yep. Isn't it weird? It's so weird. It's like, it's almost like Olympic weightlifting for people that won't train the strength component in a serious way with yeah. the deadlift and the squat. It's like they're doing Tai Chi. Yep. You know, they're doing it for the movement's sake. Yeah. 
like how much weight is this guy ever going to yeah, get over no, his head? I, yep. So if you enjoy the movement and there's this sort of meditative aspect to it, and because you can get lost in the detail and all that, I get it. That's fine. Yep. But let's call it what it is. You know, when I went to Korea, did a handful of camps. They weren't actually seminars because you couldn't become a coach because of the language barrier. We had to use translators to speak to them. And so there was no way to understand how well they coached. But they were basically seminars where you couldn't become a coach. And we did it at the Olympic Training Center in Seoul. And we got to watch the athletes, the Olympic weightlifting team, train. And we saw their weekly workout. I would have it somewhere. God, I wish I could find it. One of my old phones, I took a picture, you know, five years phones ago, so five, six phones ago. They trained six days a week, averaged two times a day. There may have been one or two days where they only trained once. And they had essentially practice sessions yep. where they trained the snatch and or the clean and jerk. And then they had training sessions where they strength trained. And that's what they did. And I remember at that time, they had a little guy, little Korean guy that probably weighed 160. Dead ass cold. Walks up and presses 205 for five. And I'm talking about dead ass strict. 205 for five, right? Press. now. I don't know how many 160 pound weightlifters in the United States can do that. And I'm, listen, I'm talking about no warm ups. First set, didn't do an empty bar, did 205 for five. Yeah, there may not be anybody Cold. in North America that can do that. I can remember it wasn't even about the thing, that specific thing. It was like they get it, they get strong, they deadlifted heavy, and they would deadlift with like a clean grip, deadlift a little more. Mm -hmm. You know, some people might look at it wasn't a snatch grip, a kind of a clean style pull. Do clean pulls where they kind of I mean, keep the shoulder over the bar a little longer. and But they went real heavy, dude. Yeah. Heavy. You know, and they did heavy squats. Of course, most Olympic weightlifters do. So they got it. When we asked them through the translators, you know, what they think about American weightlifters. Oh, be beautiful technique. Not very strong. They said the same thing. Right. And so, you know, we want to train for both. The structural adaptation is important. And I think in America, we get a little too specialized in the actual motor patterns of this. That's the problem that you end up with with these kids, with this year-round sports stuff, right? You get these dads that let their kids specialize early. I think my kid is going to be a major league baseball player. And so now instead of just school ball, they play AAU ball and they play club ball. They play you know, all year round and they, all they ever do is play baseball. And they, one, never get a chance to be exposed to other motor patterns like wrestling and track and throwing shot and football and all those things that you should be exposing your kid. Listen, if you don't want to have your kid play football, I totally support that because right. they probably shouldn't be running their heads into other people. But most of those other sports, you just expose them to the motor patterns, right? Have them swim and play soccer and jump on trampolines and go do gymnastics and all those things are important. No, no, no soccer. Why not? Why? They all end up with damaged knees. If yeah, they do. They do. You're right. Soccer has actually got the highest injury rate yes. of any sport. The football thing, running your head into people, that's a big deal. But man, yeah. I'll tell you what, yeah, no, there's you're getting right. ready to be, and probably already is, but there's going to be a huge epidemic, particularly of women with knee, replace, knee, well, knee replacements yeah. in their 40s. Yeah. It's coming by striker. Why? I actually have a theory as to why. Like on top of the on top of the obesity epidemic. Well, and on top of specifically with athletes, like people who've been soccer players or whatever. So one, they play year round. They play club sports year round. So you have a tremendous increase in the amount of turf soccer fields. Right. Turf soccer fields are grippy for a reason. You ever been on turf? Like it's full of rubber pellets. Those rubber pellets are in there. And that helps if you hit the ground, but it also very Hands much, foot. that's exactly right. So your deceleration piece is shortened. They can turn and change direction and they're way more, everybody's more agile on turf than they are on grass, right? Pulling a lot of Gs. That's exactly right. And so you get this internal rotation on the knee, much more internal rotation on the knee anyway, which tends to lead to ACL tears. And then, and then they kick each other's knees <laughs> and no strength in their hamstrings. Yeah. Because nobody trains the hamstrings because if they squat, they squat high, they squat forward on their toes. And so you've got all these, especially girls, for whatever reason, the incidence is way higher with torn ACLs and women with girls, like 16, 17, 18 year old girls, than they are with guys. And so the hamstring does the same thing as the ACL. It keeps the tibia from sliding forward. Yeah. So if I have a hamstring that's doing the job and it takes some of that tensile force off of the ACL because the hamstring is strong, then it really is one of the best things I can do to prepare myself from tearing ACL. But you couple that with putting them on turf and then make them run on it all year long. They never have time to get strong. They never do the structural adaptations, right? They never go through those sort of physiological changes. Yeah, they just lunge the whole length of the field five times a week. And it's just and the quads. That's the biceps for high school girls. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, they I can agree. look down and see them. They like, have no hamstrings. Well, I agree. that's sports specific training, barbell training athletes whether they're playing lacrosse soccer doesn't matter what they're playing put the barbell on their back and that's what we recommend thanks for listening